bring the mind to the breath and get it to stay there with a sense of ease. Not only because this is a good place to be in the present moment, but also because it's a good path. It takes us to a good place. We trust that that's so. When the Buddha teaches right view, in the very beginning we have to take it on trust as a working hypothesis. Not only the teachings on karma and rebirth, but also the teachings on the Four Noble Truths. We don't know for sure that they're going to take us to awakening or take us to a safe place, but they make sense. You have to think about the position the Buddha was in as a teacher. As he said, he could see various paths, like a person hovering above a forest, looking at various paths going through the forest. And he saw that some of the paths lead to a pit of burning embers, some of the paths lead to a cesspool, some of the paths lead to a nice lake, some lead to a comfortable mansion. Although it's interesting, the comfortable mansion in his terms was not the best place of all. The best one was a big lake with nice shady banks where you could drink the water in the lake and swim around and then rest in the bank. He saw people going on different paths to these various places. Now, the people going on the paths to the pit of burning embers or the cesspool, they weren't going that along those paths because they knew that they were going there. They liked the path. But as the Buddha said, he could see that it was a bad path, it took them to a bad place. And so when he's teaching us, he's seeing that we're already going on various paths, and the question is, are we going on good paths already, or is there a better path to follow? So he gives us reasons for changing our paths if we're on a bad path. But again, we have to take those reasons on trust. Even reason is not a guarantee, as he said. Something can be very reasonable and still be wrong. But we've seen to some extent for ourselves, for example, with karma. There's a lot about karma that's not all that hard to accept. The idea that you do have choices, and your choices make a difference in your life. They really do have results. And some of the choices have an impact right now, and some of them will have an impact further down the line. All that's pretty easy to accept and actually gives meaning to life. I know some people who prefer to think that everything is determined because they don't want to be responsible for anything. But then that doesn't leave them any choices. It doesn't give much hope. A path with hope has to say that your actions do make a difference. And you can change the way you act if you want. That's when it gets beyond that, when the Buddha talks about how these actions will have an impact not only in this lifetime, but in lifetimes to come. And the good actions will definitely have good results. It may take a while, but the quality of the intention is what's going to determine the quality of the result. Now, there are times in our lives when we like to think about that, and other times when we prefer not to. We know we've done some things under pretty bad intentions and would rather not have the consequences of those come up and catch up with us. But if you want to be consistent, that's one of the things the Buddha talks about, is that the consistency of right view. Then we've got to learn how to put up with the, put up with the bad along with the good. And that means you have to develop skill, which is what we're working on right now. So he's say, basically saying it's your development of skill is what's going to make the difference between your happiness or lack of happiness in life. We take that principle on trust. Some of the other details may be a little bit more than we can get our minds around right now. Right now. But it's good to give them a try. You know, they have that exercise where they get people to get together in groups and say, okay, imagine that you have only one year left in your life. How would you change the way you live this year? And they get together every couple of weeks and talk about it. We can give it a try. Suppose you really did believe in rebirth. How would you act? 
then you'll see that it makes you more responsible about your actions. The same with the Four Noble Truths. I mean, the Buddha is basically saying in the Four Truths that the reason we suffer is we hug our suffering to ourselves. The things that we love the most are the things that cause us to suffer the most. That goes against the grain, but we've probably noticed that, yes, that does apply to a lot of things in life. So what if we applied that insight to everything? One of the forms of suffering, he says, is not getting what you want. And the way he defines that is by saying, we all want not to die, not to have illness, not to have death. We don't want to have any separation. And yet, once you're born, these things are going to happen. And these things are not to be wished away. They're not to be gained just by wanting. The lack of illness, the lack of death. But that doesn't, he doesn't say, well, just stop wanting and you'll be okay. He basically says, well, take that desire and let's bring some skill to it. There are skills that you can master so that you don't have to experience aging, illness, and death. You don't have to suffer from these things in this lifetime and you won't have to suffer from them afterwards either. There's something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die, when there's no sense of separation at all. Again, that's something we have to take on faith. Four noble truths. Third noble truth, there is something the Buddha can't show us. And John Mahabhava has a, an interesting statement. He says, you know, if the Buddha could have taken nirvana out and put it out in the market for everybody to see, nothing else would get bought in the world. Everybody would want nirvana. It's that amazing. But it's not the kind of thing that the Buddha can take out or that any of the noble disciples can take out and show us. They can talk about it, and they can tell us how to get there and also provide us with some motivation for getting there. Because when the Buddha is teaching right view, it's directions on how to act. When he's talking about mundane right view and the principles of skillful action and unskillful action, it's basically saying skillful action should be done, unskillful action should be avoided. See, there's a should there. In the Four Noble Truths, there are duties. Suffering is to be comprehended, its cause is to be abandoned, cessation is to be realized, and the path is to be developed. And he also tells us why. It's not the case. He just says, well, do this, do this, and you'll understand afterwards. So he gives us some reasons so we can have some idea that why this would work. And those are our working hypotheses. So as I was saying today, there's only at the point of gaining your first taste of awakening where your confidence in these hypotheses is confirmed. But you don't have to just sit around and wait for awakening to come, say, yes, this is true, and then act on them. Because we're all willy-nilly acting as we take every breath. We're on a path of some kind as we take every breath. We're forced to make choices all the time. We're trying to decide what kind of action is worthwhile, what kind of action is going to be worth the effort that goes into it. This is something we're doing all the time. And he's just giving us some perspective so we can recalculate as to what's really worth doing in life, what's worth letting go. He doesn't force this on anyone. But then the fact of suffering in our lives does force us. We've got to make a choice of some kind. And we have the example of the noble ones ahead of us. This is one of the reasons why confidence that there are people who know these things is part of right view. A while back I was talking to a Buddhist scholar who was saying that he just couldn't get his head around this idea that a human being can know something unconditioned. After all, we're just conditioned beings and all we can know are conditioned things. And I have to tell him he got, the, he got it all backwards. He's starting with his definition of what people are, and then from there he decides what people can know. The Buddha did it the other way around. 
to work to see what could be known, what could be attained through human effort. He found that the deathless can be attained, which meant they had to rethink what a human being can be. And that's what we've got to do, too. Rethink what we can be. We rethink what you can do. And the Buddha is giving us the perspective for that. Otherwise, we'll be trapped in our old, conditioned ways of thinking. As I told that scholar, he was like a person who can read only three letters at a time. He sees the word antelope, and all he sees is ant. And then someone tells you, well, it's not just ant, it's antelope. And then he says, well, ants don't elope. It doesn't make any sense. So he's got to stick with the ants. There's a lot more to the Dharma than you can get your head around if you haven't practiced. And even when you practice, it's not just getting your head around. It's getting your whole body and head around, your whole being around. As the Buddha says, you see it with the body when you can't awaken it. You touch it with the body. In other words, this is not just a head experience. It's a whole all-of-you experience. Fortunately, it's nothing you have to clone. It's not by imagining it that you're going to get there. He gives you steps that you can actually do, and they will lead the mind to a point where those steps will bear fruit. We take all this on trust, but the Buddha seems to be a pretty trustworthy person. The, the Johns seem to be trustworthy people. And we'll find that as we follow the practice ourselves, we become more trustworthy too. Fortunately, the path doesn't save all of its rewards for the end. There are lots of good things we develop within ourselves as we follow the path. We become more generous, we become more virtuous, less harmful. We find that our goodwill can extend further than ever had before. And as the concentration gets developed, we find that we're a lot more solid. We begin to see the results as they come. But remember that. The story of the elephant hunter. The elephant hunter needs a big bull elephant to do a heavy work. So he goes into the forest and he sees some large elephant footprints. But he doesn't immediately jump to the conclusion that this has got to be a bull elephant, but he still follows the footprints because they look promising. After all, there are dwarf females with big feet. But still, the footprints look promising, so he follows them. He sees scratch marks up in the trees. But again, he doesn't come to the conclusion that those scratch marks were made by a big bull elephant because there are tall females with tusks. They're tall, but they're not as heavy set as a bull elephant, so they can't do the work he wants. So he still doesn't come to the conclusion that it's got to be a bull elephant. But the, the tracks look promising, so he follows them. He finally gets to a clearing. There it is, the big bull elephant. And he knows for sure. In the same way, the Buddha says the foot, footprints of the elephant, those stand for right concentration. The scratch marks stand for the psychic powers that come from concentration. Even people get strongly concentrated minds and they get psychic powers, they still don't know for sure that what the Buddha taught was, was true. It's when they've had their first taste of awakening, stream entry. It's when they see the big bull elephant in the, in the clearing. That's when you know for sure. So we follow these steps because they look promising. And then we have to see for ourselves whether what the Buddha said is there really will be a big bull elephant in the, in the clearing. Up to that point, there are going to be some doubts. But look at where your doubts will take you, to a path where action doesn't mean anything, where the end of suffering is not possible. Would you want to live in that world? Here's a world where your actions have meaning and they can lead to tr true happiness. It's a good working hypothesis to take on.